All right, we are back on the Pat Stedman podcast interview series. I, I still can't get over that name. It's so bizarre. But that's <laughs> the Pat Stedman it. podcast. That's a very like Pat Stedman thing, though, that, you know, you don't know what to name it. And it just becomes the, the podcast interview series because you just lump them all together. Um, brand we, recognition, maybe. Brand recognition, right? We have today Will Spencer mentor and host of the renaissance of men podcast will it is a real pleasure to have you on here it's great to great to be here it's good to see you again pat congratulations on the birth of your second child thank you yeah it's it's exciting it's exciting especially now like i'm really happy to have the boy out of the way because you know every every man wants a son right of course of course but I, I, honestly i wanted a daughter first and i'm i'm happy to admit this I didn't feel ready to have a son. Fair. I, you know, as a man, you project so much onto your children, but you really mm -hmm. project onto your sons. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, I, I get girls. I can mess with a girl. Um, <laughs> that'll be like a little sure. bit of an easy rollout. So I, I was really excited to have a daughter first. But by the time my wife got pregnant the second time, I'm like, all right, I'm ready for a son now. I could, I'm, I'm there. Mm -hmm. I'm a man now. I can handle it. Yeah. Statistically, you're not alone in that. In the in the book, uh, The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell, I think the book opens by saying that something like 60% of men prefer to have daughters, something like that, talks about that because some of the challenges men have with raising men today, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, one of each now, so the rest can just be whatever they are. Don't have to, <laughs> exactly. Don't have to it's just it. gravy. Cool. So let's uh, let's dive into this. So yeah. tell me a little bit about your journey here. Tell the audience. I mean, I, I know some of it already, but I'm set set the stage for men. What is what is the renaissance of men? Because you, mm -hmm. you really coined this movement and I want to talk about it. I want guys to sort of think in the terms that I, I think that you're thinking about yeah. what's going on right now. So the renaissance of men is the 40 year process to redeem masculinity. So I, I didn't start the Renaissance of men. The Renaissance of men started 40 years ago um, in the 1980s with uh, the mythopoetic era and with um, Robert Bly, Douglas Gillette, you know, that, that whole era and also Warren Farrell. Um, and I'll just go through what I see as the four phases of the Renaissance. And so you and me and everyone listening, we're on the leading edge of a 40 year wave that's about to crash over world culture. We can actually kind of see it starting to happen. You can kind of start to see the white cap peaks on the wave as it begins to break. So the, the era that followed that was the pickup era in like the late nineties, early ish, two thousands. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into kind of the red pill manosphere era right and so that phase we'll talk about this is, is probably coming to its conclusion you know pin that for a second and then now we're heading into an era of um fatherhood family and faith mm -hmm. and that will be that will be the ultimate conclusion and that there'll be enough in that to pursue for a while so to redeem masculinity following 150 years of what i call the war on masculinity that eventually essentially began in the industrial revolution and it took shape, you know, through the late 1800s into the early 1900s with a couple world wars, and then the massive political cultural shifts that started in the 50s and 60s, and really metastasized up until today, where we can't even say that a man and a woman are different, that they're all the same, and gender gender is a thing and interchangeable. That 150-year war on masculinity uh, provoked a response that began in the 1980s and is now beginning to culminate into, the, into this moment to respond to those um, unnatural, radical cultural changes with a reassertion of what um, timeless, traditional masculinity is. And so that's the renaissance of men is the totality of that process. So I, I just I just saw it and gave it a name. I obviously didn't start it. Well, this is this is really interesting. I, I, I want to give guys the history of this. And, you know, for a lot of the guys in the manosphere, I've talked a little bit about this before, but I, I want you to go into it. They have an idealization of anything pre-1960. Um, Oof, no. You know, there's this sense that 
like 1950s was, you know, that that was the ideal family dynamic no. or that, you know, men used to be tough and men would fight and men would, you know, work long hours and that that was like this key era of masculinity. So um, why is that view distorted? For, for a couple of reasons. So um, many actually. So the thing about the 1950s and um, well, okay. So in American culture today, we fixate uh, on two particular decades, epics as formative for our current American identity, the 1960s and the 1940s or World War II. Both of those are screens they hide, they obscure the truth that the true formative decades that got us here today were the 1910s and World War I and the 1950s. All the groundwork for the sexual revolution that happened in the 1960s was laid in the 1950s with Playboy and with the Kinsey sex study and with the beat poets like Jack Kerouac, but he wasn't the best example of that. He had, there's a book about Jack Kerouac. He was actually very conservative though he hung out with very, very liberals. And you had um, Bob Dylan, and you had, um, gosh, there's there's his mentor. The name will come to me, um, who was uh, um, Howell, the guy who wrote Howell. You remember that? You know that poem. Anyway, it'll come to me later. Anyway, so so all these guys. I mean, they were um, they were diddle, Some of them were diddling kids. Let's put it that way. I don't know. I don't know. Like some of the guys in the beat poet era. Bob Dylan's mentor. His name will come to me. Gallon Ginsberg. Howell. Oh, Ginsburg. Yeah, yeah Ginsburg. Yeah. 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 So yeah. like, so this is Bob Dylan's mentor, right? So, but this was all going on under, under the covers, and then the 1960s it exploded into the public consciousness. Now, and then the 1910s were um, in the 1920s. You had the Jazz Age, right? The Roaring Twenties, right? That was the liberalization of sexual attitudes that then led further to the 1950s. So, so underneath the surface of the of the supposedly idyllic post world 1950s was this bubbling of the sexual revolution that was going to explode. Right. Mm -hmm. And then World War One was in many ways the end of history. Like yeah. the, the world, the pivot point of the world was World War One, industrialized warfare on a scale that mankind had never heard of before. And World War One, 10 million soldiers died. And between that and the Industrial Revolution, what we actually lost sight of was uh, what we currently identify as being on the homestead. Right. We didn't used to go to corporations and big build buildings to work until the factory was invented. Men had small farms with their wife and their kids, you know, or um, or trade or they were doing trades in community. And that was as idyllic as it possibly gets. But that was not an easy life. The 1950s was very superficial. It was the rise of the corporate man and the industrialized home. So we look at it from our current lens and say, wow, that was really nice. But actually, the 1950s. If you look at the, um, if you look at the artwork that displayed the men, the, the the way that they marketed the suburban dream, you had men and women walking to this like small, mo like relatively modest home with a lot of green land, right, in the suburbs. That was the suburban dream. That was an echo of the homestead dream a couple generations prior on mm -hmm. the frontier of America. It was calling back to this memory that men of that generation in the 1950s didn't have, but was still in their blood and still in their bones, but had been lost through successive war and industrialization, but that's still a part of us. And you see it beginning to flower again today with a lot of guys really considering the homestead life. That's part of us as beings, not this artificial urban corporate kind of way of living. And we know that. And I think we're starting to get back to that. I, I love that you're giving a lot of this real history because I think that the problem with the men's movement today, the manosphere today is that, and and I don't blame the guys necessarily for this, but, I, but it's because it's a knee jerk reaction, but it's, it's a reactionary space. Yeah. And when you're reacting, you're not necessarily thinking. So they, they see this thing was bad. This thing caused something bad. So therefore what was bad, before it was good <laughs> yes. and, and they can't see that well what was before it set the stage for what came after it mm -hmm. you know 1950s this is something i don't think guys really get about women see, everyone's all about like you know you got to retire your wife you know your wife wants to be a homemaker look i think that women are 
very happy to, to be at home with children. I think a lot of them like to have some kind of part-time work, but not mm -hmm. all of them. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes they'd like to be home with kids, but there's this sort of idea that the end goal is for your, like you to somehow do everything that is, you know, generative for the family. Mm. And then your, your wife Good word. Is maybe siloed into some sort of domestic role. Mm -hmm. And it's just not really historical. This whole idea of like women not really doing much. Women worked a ton. Mm -hmm. They were, they worked, a, they did different kinds of work, mm -hmm. but they worked a ton. And one of the reasons that women were so depressed in the 1950s, and, and I don't want to be too reactionary with that count. You know, I'm sure a lot of women had good lives. And sure. I certainly think they had a better life than a lot of women do today. There's no doubt about that. Mm. But one of the things I've noticed, especially having kids, is that women, first off, don't want to be only with kids all sure. the time. Mm -hmm. It's Women are, are certainly designed to take care of young children way more than men, yep. but they want to be around other women at the same time with that. They need to have a community aspect with that. And if you were just to kind of have them in a house by themselves most of the day where they're cooking and cleaning and just trying to keep this little like perfect little bubble. I mean, no wonder they were so depressed that it's it wasn't they were very, very contained. And I, and I, I think I don't know, you, you have a better historical background than me, but I think so much of this like um, glamorizing it came from basically upper class uh, upper class arist aristocratic families in in england where it was like which of course transposed over to america in the wasp circles of mm -hmm. you know if you have if, if you're wealthy then your woman just kind of hangs out you know <laughs> like <laughs> jane austen yeah exactly exactly to you know i think uncertain effects because that's where also the degeneracy came from later you know you mm -hmm. have like the super super strictness of, of the victorian era that then led to like mass degeneracy but that was a response that was a response to the sexual license of the french revolution that's true as well yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so so i think it's good for us to put this in perspective like wh where where were families actually anchored in in and it was in the, in these homesteads. It was, and especially in America. I mean, mm -hmm. America had its reputation because, like, people had land, they had they had their small business, and it's not so much about the man working. In my perspective, it's about the woman working for some amorphous corporate entity. Bingo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So. We have the '60s and the '70s, so tell tell people because I'm I'm honestly only familiar with Robert Bly's work. I'm not. I've mm -hmm. heard of. Um, I just forgot his name. I heard of one Douglas of Douglas Gillette. I, I I've heard of Gillette, I think, but Robert I, Moore. No, I I don't I don't I haven't heard of Moore. So tell so tell us about okay. like what happened in the '80s. Yeah. So um. So real quick, just from the historical perspective. Uh, you're right. And I think a lot of a lot of what you're saying about the 1950s came from a lack of understanding of what a home is and what a home is for. Yeah. A home is not a house. Like home started to be this place where everyone sleeps and hangs out at night. Right. And which is just a house. It's just a building. A home is a is a concept. It's a theological, spiritual concept that has real that has real value. And it lost that value when it stopped being the center of economic production and it became the office, right? Mm -hmm. and, and home lost its, its spiritual value when the center of education became the school. You take dad and the kids out of the house and you leave, and you leave the wife at home alone with an essentially mechanized house. Women have aspirations. Like this shouldn't be controversial to say whether the ultimate fulfillment of a woman's aspirations can be found in a mega corporate structure. I don't think so. 
But that only seems appealing when the husband isn't there to contribute and create a family run business that she can participate and contribute her unique creativity and perspective to. So it's the removal of the husband and the, and the sending him to the corporate world. I've been taking this all apart. I think the rise of the nice guy is entirely based on the, on the corporate, um, the rise of corporate structures, which we can talk about separately. Um, the, go ahead. No, I was actually going to say, I, I think maybe I was jumping to the eighties, but I think maybe it's, it's important for us to, to visit what exactly the industrial revolution followed by industrial warfare, what exactly did it do to men? Oh, I mean, it's incalculable. This is what, so you mentioned Robert Bly. This is what his book, Iron John references. He says in Iron John, the love unit most damaged by the industrial revolution has been the father son bond mm -hmm. because what it, you, what, fathers and sons used to do is the father would have a trade. Maybe he'd be a blacksmith or a tailor or, or something like that. And he would run his business to whatever level of prosperity he was able to achieve. And then he would pass the business on to his son or his sons. And in the process of teaching his son, the trade, he would impart vital lessons about masculinity, you know, hard work, you know, um, the, the attention to detail, excellence, honor, all these things, right? Providing for a family, those were passed directly from father to son. But when you take dad out of the home and you put him in a factory, the son is deprived that, that direct education. In fact, there was something in the UK called, I think it was called the Enclosure Act, where, where homestead farmers in England were like literally their their land was seized by the crown and they were sent off by force to work in the factory. Like your land is ours now. Thank you. Bye. Right. Like, there are a lot of guys like talking about bringing monarchy by, back right now. It's like, well, let's talk about that real yeah. quick. Right. Yeah. Go fuck and, yourself. <laughs> exactly. 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 Yeah. It's, I don't think it's, you know, I, I, I understand some of their longing for the great man theory, but I don't know that history bears that out as being a universal good. Anyway. So, um, so Robert Bly, so he talks about how the industrial revolution really separated fathers from sons. And that was devastating generationally that had never happened before. Like, yes, maybe dad would go off to fight in war and he would die, but at least you knew that your, your dad died, you know, serving a greater cause when he goes to work for some nameless faceless factory, some grand industrialist like well, Rockefeller or whatever, you know, it's not the same thing as, as father dying, you know, by the sword on the bat on the field of battle. And then World War I was this great betrayal of all the best parts of masculinity because men used to go and to fight in war to earn honor and glory. But when you have industrialized warfare, giant cannons and gas and, you know, uh, Gatling machine guns, like you can, you can be on the battlefield and done. Sorry, you're not the main character. And, mm -hmm. and you don't even see it coming. You know, and there's nothing left of you. Are you, I mean, there's all sorts of, just grueling poetry about the experience of World War One, gas, you know, gas attacks and all that stuff. And the men who came back, the men who survived World War One, it was a shattering experience. And that's why you have um, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway. You know, their their writing is very um, compared to the writing that had come before, very nihilistic because they just didn't know what to do with the fact that human life that seems so significant in the field of battle with swords like eye to eye right had suddenly become meaningless in the face of a mechanization and yeah. so there was this dislocation that happened to their them psychologically and then you know you have and then you you come out of world war one and then you head straight into the roaring 20s drugs sex you know particularly like jazz jazz was fueled by heroin like uh, miles davis writes about this heroin was driven by the um it was driven by uh, the, the, the mafia. So the Godfather the movie, the Godfather, if you've seen it, the reason why spoiler alert, the reason why the Godfather gets killed is that the Corleone crime family won't support the production of heroin. They won't support the sale of heroin. That's why he gets whacked. Right. So it all centers around that in the jazz age. And then you have the great depression, right? Where men in the countryside and the city lose their livelihoods. And then you throw them straight into world war II industrialized death on an even larger scale. Mm -hmm. Now we in America look at world war II favorably because we won. Right. But I don't know that Europe looks at it quite the same way. Like if you're, if you're French, if you're Spanish, if you're Italian, I, German is a whole thing. Right. But we over here like, yeah, world war II is like, yeah, we are the winners, but the devastation on men's psyches in the West over that, it's just 50 years incalculable. And that was how much it took. 
That was literally how much it took two, six, two or three successive generations obliterating, destroying men to have men's value system so leveled that in the 1950s, you could begin seeding the sexual revolution, you know, through Playboy, Playboy specifically in Kinsey, so that when those sons and daughters came of age in the 1960s, you could hit them with sex and drugs and rock and roll and the destruction of all prior Western values. And they swallowed it hook, line and sinker. And, you know, you can look into the giant psychological operation that that was as well. That's that information starting to come out. Well, yeah, Playboy was a CIA operation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll actually dig into it. I Kins mean, Kinsey was friends with Crowley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and, and when you, God, it's such a rabbit hole. I, I know a lot of the audience, Huge. like, they don't want to accept these kind of things, but you're totally right. You have to go back to World War One. World War One was, you could say, where, I mean, you can always obviously see a cause and effect anytime, but right. World War One is the event that really set in motion everything that we see today. Yes. Um, World War II, I mean, you can argue that all these wars have just been continuations mm -hmm. of, of World War I. And of course, you get into all this, all actually what happened in World War I, how it got set up. I mean, yep. I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, have, have a professor who keyed me in on some of these things with, you know, the diplomatic cables that the Brits, you know, everyone blames the Germans for World War One, but the Brits manipulated the whole thing to get Lusitania. The well, yeah, and and then of course they they yeah then they brought the Americans in yeah. through that manner. Um, it's it's really such a mess when you really yeah. look at it, and you can see how it's like that they start to create this reactionary cycle that goes on and on and on. An another thing I want to comment on also about the 1950s is that. I, another thing I don't think a lot of Americans realize when they th think about the, I, you know, how idyllic the 1950s were. We also were benefiting from an economic environment, which is almost impossible to recreate. It's gone. After World War II, Europe's entire economy was completely devastated. And it was something like 30 something percent of the entire global economy was the United States alone. Mm. And so we we had a golden age in many ways because we had no competition at all in mm. Europe need to buy everything from the states to rebuild itself. And that's like a piece that's that's forgotten. I mean, there's been obviously tons of really terrible economic policies. Don't get me wrong. You know, <laughs> One or two. Yeah. Intentional deindustrialization since then. Yeah. So, but that was a very like you'd have to have most of the world get completely destroyed in order to create a level of such economic dominance that america had after world war ii so yeah, yeah. Uh, and i just, I just want to make one other other comment for you know, a handful of monarchists here <laughs> i i just i get it when you have like clown world democracy you mm. know you think we should go back to a monarchy. I mean, if you go down the rabbit hole again, you might see the clown world democracy as an illusion of some monarchs. Mm -hmm. But the big point I want to make for people is that I don't think it's appreciated today just how incredible America was. And still is. And still is. It still has. I mean, I don't think that the fire's gone, mm -mm. but what this country was founded on. I'm not, I'm not trying to be boomer here. It, it, it's, it's little detailed things like what you just said with the enclosure acts, Americans own their land. It's their fucking land. Even mm -hmm. in Europe today, you don't own your land. You own land use rights, mm -hmm. but theoretically they can just take it from you if they want to take it from you. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very, and, and, the Europeans were leaving Europe to come to America because it was a place where a man could be, he could be the leader of his own home. Mm -hmm. It's a very, it creates a very, very different attitude among the men. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's still some of that fire there, but they're really working hard to extinguish it. Um, so we go into the eighties what 
So what what started to happen in the 80s? I mean, this is after the sexual revolution kind of burned itself out. I don't know if inflation burned out the industrial. Do you think inflation killed the industrial, the sexual revolution? What do you think? Do you think it just got old? I, I think I, I think that they they started having kids. I yeah. think I think boomers, uh, yeah, they start they finally started having kids. Like okay, ultimately, ultimately, despite all their sexual rebellion, they found that they still had traditional values embedded, and they still want to settle down and have kids, and that became you know, generation X and, uh, and some late, some early millennials too. The eighties, uh, are a really interesting decade because I think for a lot of, um, younger people, the eighties are the idyllic decade that they look back to. So our parents look at the fifties and romanticize it. And so I think a lot of younger people look to the eighties and romanticize that, which is synth wave and all that stuff. And some of that music is actually pretty good. good yeah. Music. And I was too young in the eighties to really remember it, but something I did something really interesting the other day, I went to YouTube and on YouTube there's channels. It's like, you know, three hours of soothing eighties commercials. If you, I don't know if you've ever seen those videos before. So, so like these were when I was a little kid and like, that's interesting that YouTube served that. And I put them on, I put one of the videos on and I watched it. And of course I saw many commercials that I recognized from being a little kid, but I, I started watching it and I, I left it on and I, and, and I didn't find it to be soothing at all. It was at first because it reminded me of being a little kid playing with my toys in front of the TV. But the longer I watched as an adult, I actually got really disturbed. Hmm. I was really disturbed by it because it was peak consumerism. Yeah, it was peak. It took everything it, and any notion of there being higher transcendent or spiritual values was gone in the 1980s and consumption was put in its place. And, you know, someone made a joke and said, I mean, it was a comment said, you know, this was the peak of the American empire. And I actually, I, I don't think so. I think that was just when people's spiritual hunger grew so deep and there was no place to really fill it, that people started filling it with stuff. Yeah. And so to get back to Robert Bly and Douglas Gillette, I think in the 1980s, the, the crisis of masculinity had just started to show up. So no fault divorce had become a thing. Ronald Reagan signed that into law in California. He later said it was his greatest mistake and no fault divorce for those who don't know. is just the idea that, um, that one member of a marriage can end it without any reason, without domestic abuse or infidelity or financial irresponsibility. You can just decide to end the marriage. Right. Mm -hmm. And so predominantly it was women who took advantage of that. And we can take all that apart. Um, it still is today. And so, um, so you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of single parent, single mother homes. Um, you started to see like a real gap between children's economic, uh, uh, academic performance who were raised in intact families versus raised in single mother homes. And this was what led Warren Farrell, for example, to leave the national organization of women, you know, as this worldwide speaking male feminist, he law he left that organization mm -hmm. and started speaking out against this. He later told me on my podcast, he said that decision cost him tens of millions of dollars just because of he because he started disavowing. They tried to they tried to threaten him actually too, he said. But anyway, so Robert Bly and Douglas Gillette, you know, they're they're poets and psychologists, and they're looking at this this dawning crisis of masculinity and realizing that something's wrong, that there's an emptiness in men. And men are acknowledging the empty, emptiness as well. So, um, so what they, so as psychologists, as humanists, they said, well, what men need is a return to earthy wildness. We're so commercialized, so corporate, you know, that we'll get men back out into the forest and do and do rituals and get dirty, you know, and have initiations and drum around the fire. And mm -hmm. so that was that was that that movement. Lots of men's initiations in the woods you know, lots of drumming, lots of Native American kind of earthy kind of kind of practices. Jungian psychology was very big to kind of fuse, you know, the Jungian psychology would surface the deepest themes out of men's psyches, and then they would go reenact them in the forest privately and secret. And it was hugely popular. Uh, Robert Bly did a, a show with Bill Moyers uh, called The Gathering of Men because Robert Bly was doing this nationwide tour for men only, you get auditoriums together, and he would uh, read some of his poetry. He was a very accomplished poet, sing songs, play music, tell stories to this whole audience is full of men. And so Bill Moyers produced a little mini 40 minute documentary about that with an interview with Robert Bly. That only came out on VHS. You had to order a VHS tape shipped through the mail and it became a national, it became a national bestseller. 
the men were so hungry for this information about masculinity. And that really kicked off the, what later came to be called the myth of poetic men's movement. Yeah. Marianne Williamson, if you know that name, was part of it. Yeah. Um, uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves, Dr. Clarissa Pinkle Estes was part of it as well. Dancing with the Wolves, is that her book? What was that? What was Women Who Run With the Wolves, yeah. yeah. It's a, for, it's a it's, it's pagan, but it's a great it's a great book. So this was a big nationwide movement that took everyone kind of by storm. I think actually the book I'm thinking of is something about Dancing with the Flame or something like that. There's some... Fire in the Belly by Sam Keen? No, it's Mar Marianne Williamson or Woodson. Probably Marianne Williamson. She was part of it. She's yeah. since become political, but she was a uh, Jungian, very Jungian as well. Yeah, I think she she wrote a series of like quasi mystical New Agey kind of books called. Maybe it's Marion Conversation. Woodman. I don't. I'm trying to think of what what this. Was. Oh, um, yeah, Marion Woodman. That's that that name does sound familiar. Yeah, that that's who it was. Yeah, yeah. she was a mythopoetic author. What was the yeah. book? Anyway, uh, where is it? Where is it? almost here dancing in the flames yeah the dark the oh. dark goddess and the transformation of consciousness yeah i read that just a few weeks ago oh how was uh, that it was good it was really good actually i mean i i like Jungian books mm -hmm. it, it uh it, it the thing about these books when i read some of young or when i read like this is a heavy dream analysis book mm. and i'm always kind of a little jealous like man i wish i'd wish i really knew dream analysis like that you know i wish i, I do dream it i do dream analysis yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's um how did you get into it? What did you read for that? Well, uh ironically, this the same thing that started my um my study to understand uh men and masculinity, same uh -huh. class. I took a class on Jungian psychology when I was in college in uh 2001, uh, fall of 2001. And so I took a class on Jungian psychology that had dream interpretation as part of it, and also a class on uh part of that class, the same class was uh, how the Lord of the Rings relates to masculinity mm. and because the Lord of the Rings movies were just coming out at that time. And of course they're amazing, amazing yeah. films. And, and um, that was the first time that I realized, cause I had grown up a very thoughtful, reflective, very sensitive boy, not particularly athletic tall, but not particularly athletic. Wasn't part of the values of my family. My family's values were achieve academically at all costs. Mm -hmm. And so I paid all those costs, but I did a great job. So I grew up, you know, not, uh, without a lot of, um, connection with boys, my age. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was you know, a nice guy, you know, feminized to a degree. And I always thought that because I wasn't into pizza and beer and football, that there was something wrong with me. I thought I was broken. Right. And so then I took this class and I realized that no, my, my mind works fine. I'm not broken at all. And it's actually okay that I'm the kind of man that I am. And that, and then um, this is jumping a little ahead a little bit. A number of years later, I went on the Mankind Project New Warrior Training Adventure, which was a men's retreat that was born out of the Mythopoetic era. Twenty years prior, I went in 2013, so this is 20 years after it had been created. And I realized that it's okay for me to be the kind of man that I am, and it's okay for those men to kind of be the to be the kind of men that they are, more physically oriented. That's okay. But I mean, obviously there's a superficial way of being that way, and you, which is why I love what you say about being an integrated man, because yeah. that was what I discovered is that it's okay to be the kind of man that I am and I can learn from the kind of men that they are. And hopefully they can learn from the kind of man that I am, which mm -hmm. is everything that I talk about and you write about it so brilliantly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm curious what you think about, about this because, you know, there's a, it's a little less of a topic now, but like maybe five years ago, even mm. there is, there's a lot of um, performative masculinity <laughs> that's yeah. used in like conservative circles. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, like the big one with bacon, like, yeah, you like oh. bacon. You're a, you're a man. If you know, you're, you eat bacon and you know, and even yeah. the master still kind of does it with steaks. I mean, yeah. I'll eat steak. Don't get me wrong. Big on steak. Think men should eat steak, but, <laughs> you know, there, but but you know there there is this like you have to drink certain drinks and you have to you know eat, whiskey eat cigars things yeah 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 and but you know it was funny and this is less so in the manosphere at least the manosphere is a little bit better with it but in mainstream it's like you'd have some really just like usually like overweight you know dad bod best case scenario doofusy guy who's like yeah. he's got his man cave and he's got his yeah. beer and he's got his sports and um 
you know, it's 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 not really even masculinity. Mm -mm. And and so I, I don't know how familiar you are. I mean, you may not like his work, but he has some interesting ideas. Bronze Age pervert. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've read I've read his book a couple of times. There's but one of the things I thought in his book that was really, really interesting was when he talks about homosexuality and how homosexuality to a certain extent, his argument. And I don't I don't agree with it fully just for, you know, censors and people. But I, I but, it, but it gives an interesting thought experience experiment mm -hmm. about how is isn't is some degree of what's going on with homosexuality increasing besides sort of the obvious like push for it yeah was it is is it a rejection of like you can't find yourself to be a, a man in this current space and so it's a fetish fetishization of that masculinity or i would maybe even take some of the argument further which is that you know maybe there's no space for them to be the kind of man that they would want to be. And so then it becomes like, well, then I have to be gay. I have to be a woman. So they, they have a fetishization for it. And then, you know, I, I just, I, I, yeah. I cause we don't have healthy outlets for, for men to sort of explore the spectrum. It's like, they're always siloed in these different areas. Like I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not to say that you get rid of the physical element because it's obviously not that the physical element is crucial to the development of a man. But it's it's just like you can be a man in this little like narrow corridor. Mm -hmm. That's being a man. And I think in many ways for the conservatives that got it's a little less so now because they've gone full commie. But they were siloing men into the military mm -hmm. to get killed in, in, in wars by saying, Oh, if you want to be a man, you know, join the Marines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, everything that you said. Those are all spot on observations. Um, the challenge comes from the root theology of feminism. Mm -hmm. The root theology of feminism is that women have been oppressed through all of history and for all of time. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that, if you believe that as a man, then you have to bow the knee to women. Yeah. Now, if you bow the knee to women, to all women, what does that mean? It means that if you want to, if you want to create yourself as a man, you must do it in such a way that doesn't offend the object of your theology, women, right? And so, um, so the mythopoetic guys, this is my critique of them. To be fair, this was in the 80s, so things hadn't gone as crazy as they are today. But they accepted the feminist lie that women have been oppressed through history. Mm -hmm. And so they sought to define masculinity within bounds that women would find acceptable. Right. Now, I've been I've tweeted about this, I think it was yesterday or the other day. Um, women are have yet to figure out that a masculinity that worries about stepping on their toes isn't the kind of masculinity that they want. Mm -hmm. And so for the past 40 or so years in American culture, as men have been trying to recreate themselves, they've been attempting to recreate themselves in a way that won't offend their feminine overlords. Right. right? And that feminine overlord might live in the house with you. Mm -hmm. That feminine overlord might be, you know, the head of the family after your grandfather passes away. Yeah. And so men who seek to assert a form of masculinity that doesn't bow down to women gets immediate instantaneous pushback from every environment a man finds himself in. You'll feel it at work. If not from your boss, from your colleagues, you may feel it at home. You'll feel it shopping. You'll feel it everywhere around you. We as men today, it's less, it's, it's getting less. So that's, it's beginning to break. We as men today live in a matrix that's defined by women's approval of our behavior. And when you stop giving that approval, to women's behavior and you seek to emulate men and take their approval, uh, your honor group, like you define an honor group of men. And, and I, I feel like I want to pause for a second to take that apart. Mm -hmm. So an honor group of men cannot be men that you follow on the internet. 
Like I follow this guy on the internet and you can think of lots of names and what would he do? No, your honor group of men needs to be in your local environment. It has to be men that you can meet eye to eye with. And you as this group of men, 10, 12, pick, pick whatever number you determine based on your values in your local environment, what behavior is honorable and not. And you do that with best practices. I would root it in religion and we can talk about that separately, but that honor group defines your behavior. And those men are the ones who give you your honor for whom you are accountable. And so if the woman in your life says that she doesn't like you behaving that way, you check with the guys, is this honorable behavior? And if they say yes, right, that's vertical, on horizontal honor. You have your horizontal honor. Like, sorry, babe, deal with it, right? Yeah. Now, the, the other dimension of that, and there's a great book uh, by Brett McKay, Art of Manliness, called What is Honor? And he talks about this. He breaks this down. So uh, honor with your honor group is horizontal honor. And you also need honor with your with God and with your conscience. That's vertical honor, right? Yeah. So you can't just have horizontal honor because you know guys are like, hey, watch this. That's what guys get to. Yeah, without, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so your conscience has to be aligned. But if your horizontal honor with your brothers and your conscience is aligned in your behavior, if you have both of those, then that determines your behavior. And that is what's needed to shatter this grip that the feminist theology have has over men's minds. Now that's beginning to happen. But again, men get lots of pushback from it. In fact, I've had a couple guys contact me for my mentorship program just in the past couple of weeks saying like, my wife won't let me do it. I said, it's not up to, up to your wife. Like, I'm here. <laughs> no, really. I've had to say like, look, it's not up to her. You earn the money. Like, do I, what I say and does the content I produce, does it satisfy your conscience that I'm, that I'm a good man, that I'm not going to teach you to do anything that's going to turn you into a tyrant? Do I satisfy your conscience? Do you have the ability to pay? And, and I, I work with them through that whole process because this is a ministry for me. And they say, yes, and we start working, right? But like men live, I live this way. That's how I know about it is I had to break that in my mind. And I think it's so society wide and the power is so strong that, you know, women's authority is unchallengeable until you just finally do it and then they can't do anything about it. God, it it's such a good point. And it is, it, it is almost like a matrix yeah. that, like you break out of and then sometimes you're like wait a minute i'm still the matrix like you know i thought i got out of it that it's still there you know yeah. and, and i think that again to kind of hit on the conservative circles conservative circles are um very deferential to women yeah. still and mm -hmm. and look i'm not i'm not like a i'm not radical about this stuff i i don't I'm not about like siloing women. I no. believe they should have their choice. I think if they had open choice and not a controlled sort of culture directing certain things that we would probably not see the proportions of women in politics that we see today. I don't particularly care that there is a woman politician or something like that. I do think though that, you know, there has been a concentrated push to have men look to this and and it almost to have the women tell men what to get outraged about mm -hmm. what should men care about and i i have to and, and what's interesting to me is that we go through this awakening movement is that in defense of women who probably didn't realize the extent of, of which you know what they were creating becomes a problem now you have like a real fight on your hands and there are so many men who like have no idea what to do for themselves they're like looking like the women are pissed off they want to do something and of course ahead of them is a, is a particularly aggressive group of men who are like the leaders i would say of the of the counter revolution but it's like those men then a bunch of women and who are like why are all the men like pussies yeah. it's like well you made them pussies yeah talk to your mother talk to your yeah. grandmother yeah yeah yeah, it it's it's it is really and, and I think it's it's fair for guys to go through a process of trying to like they push away from it completely and then they kind of come back and they and they try to be reasonable. And then there's a, there's sort of like a figuring out of, as you were saying, how do you get into that vertical position mm -hmm. where you you know that what you're doing, you're not just doing it for the fact that you're going to be in control like right. i think that's a problem that a lot of the red pill guys miss and and you know you brought it up with religion i think women miss it too like i was at a wedding just the other week 
And when you talk about when there's that that God is it um, is it it's probably Ephesians I think where the you you would know better than me correct me if I'm wrong but where the woman submits to the man mm-hmm. it's all throughout Paul's letters yeah all throughout Paul's letters the woman submits to the man but the man submits to God boom like that's always forgotten always it's that. The, the man is supposed to be acting in accordance with God's will, not his own will. Yes. So it's not this like, you know, fuck you, bitch, like get me dinner. <laughs> you know, like, right. Like, no, you nailed it. That's yeah. look, the red pill. Like the, 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 the usefulness of the red pill dies right at the doorstep of this thing called dread game mm-hmm. that you have to keep your wife in a state of dread to keep her, in line essentially because you as a man have unchallenged power now that's not actually a thing unchallenged power is not a thing right Mm -hmm. we're seeing that nate we're seeing that nationwide right now unaccountable power right so if you as a man believe that you know that dating and marriage is a power struggle which is essentially you know kind of the way that the red pill frames things is that someone's sexual selection strategy has to lose that's how yeah. it frames it, right? So if, so if if hers has to lose and you win, then you have to stay in the position of a winner. How do you stay in the position of a winner in the in the context of a household and in a marriage? By asserting power. How do you assert power in a marriage when you're actually married? Assuming you know, like assuming that you're not going to be some sort of domineering tyrant, you do it subtly through a dread game. So she's always afraid of losing you. You're controlling her through, her through fear, right? Mm-hmm. That's how you get the quote unquote submission. That's I mean, how disgusting is that? That your that your wife has to live in fear of you? I don't think that that's I don't think that that's good. But that's all the red pill can propose, because the alternative is Christianity, mm-hmm. you know, which is which is your wife submits to you and you submit to Christ. And the reason why you know how hard it is for your wife to submit to you and you honor her in that is because you submitting yourself to God is equally hard. So you're both in submission together in different ways. And so that ge- that gives you because you as a man recognize that you require and receive grace and forgiveness and that you screw up and that you apologize right and so you understand what it is to be in that position so you don't have to wield an iron fist over your wife and she's also part of the same she's still part of the same belief structure that that guides her behavior as well and you all consent to this and it's not comfortable and it's not easy our natural desire of humans is to be rebellious and prideful. No, I want my way. It's like, well, virtue says otherwise. Discipline says otherwise. Restraint of your desires is the true is the true nobility, not the wanton fulfillment of them. And so, the, the, you know, there you go. Well, I totally agree with that. And I and I think what's what guys also miss, you know, because you have the corollary to this is the obsession with frame control. And, right. I, you know. Obviously, I agree it's important to have frame, but you know the easiest way to have frame is to actually be doing the right thing. Yeah, moral, <laughs> like, virtuous like, moral authority. Yeah, like if if you, I, I mean, there are some guys who I don't think have a moral compass, and yes. for them, they may, you know, they're they're in power dynamics. They're in what I would call the inverted matrix, and they are going to have frame only to the extent that other people don't and you know if you're a woman you you don't want to date one of those guys um Mm -hmm. similarly if you're a guy you don't want to date one of those women but if you're with someone who has a moral compass which i'd say is most people for sure um weak but yes most yeah yeah most people some people have weak moral compasses but at least yeah yeah i only i only think it's like about three percent of the population is truly evil psychopaths um, yeah psychopaths or 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 are in that area yeah and, and 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 which is an amount that you need to acknowledge that they are relevant right. <laughs> you know, I, I mean the psychopaths are the ones that if you need to really you know if you really need your society to be able to accomplish something you know amoral you need those people right yeah. but it's only bad when a psychopath uses his lack of conscience as a competitive advantage against other people because yeah. a psychopath can acknowledge that like, look, I don't have this, but I still want to work along with the group, but sorry, continue. No, I was just going to say, I mean, it's the, the problem with psychopaths and in, in power structures is that 
you know, someone who isn't a psychopath isn't usually interested in trying to control people. So right. they don't get involved with things like the government, <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't want it. So people are like, well, how do you, you know, like you say that a lot, like, I don't know if it's a majority, but a huge number of the people who are in these positions of power are psychopaths. Yes. So, and, and people are like, Oh, well, I'm not a psychopath. Like, how would they be? So it's like, you like, please think about this for a second. There's books it's about this. Easy. I mean, they're sheep. They're, they're sheep. It's not even, I don't want to, you know, whatever. Like just the pop yeah, yeah. public. But when it, <laughs> I just bother, yeah. it, it just make me pissed off. But um, yeah. read the book snakes and suits and you'll see. Yeah. Yeah. But people may have maybe weak and, and buckle under pressure. And that's one yeah. thing, but for guys, if they're doing the right thing and they have a moral compass that actually gives them strength, they're getting, and you can, you could use it. And you could say that they're getting strength from God in that mm -hmm. sense, that Very God so. is powering their masculinity and their ability yes. to hold boundaries. Yes. Because in their ability to speak the truth, because that's what they're doing. Whereas and their authority to do so. Yeah. Whereas when you are trying to do it just for yourself, if you don't, if you have a moral compass, you're going to like, you might be able to get away with it for like an instant incident, but mm -hmm. it's fundamentally, it becomes disempowering over time because you know that what you're doing is wrong. And so there tends to be a rebellion on her part. And, you know, so I, I think that's one of the issues with a lot of this red pill thinking is uh, it, well, let, let's just call it what it is. I mean, it's an adolescent stage of development. I mean, we have such yes. an arrested development in society right now yep. that yep. the red pill is like this. It's like guys who didn't have the opportunity to go through like teenage rebellion are now joining the red pill and doing it. Sometimes they're like 50, you know, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, it's, yeah. it's, um, and, and that's important. Like, I don't want to say it's not important, but no. it's a phase. The point that the, the point that I try to get men to see is that we are part, I said at the beginning, we're part of a leading wave. And that wave is an ongoing dialogue to redeem masculinity. It's a process. The Renaissance of men is a process. And there are stages in the process. Like I may find what the pickup guys did, like objectively immoral dangerous, risky, exploitative. Like I can put all those words to it, but it was a pro it was a, it was a phase that needed to be go that needed to be gone through. Mm -hmm. And so my critique of the manosphere is that it tries to solve the problem of father hunger using lots of older brothers, mm. right? So it's a whole bunch of older brothers trying to figure out what it means to be a man. Cause there's no father there. The answer is you actually ask fathers or you become a father, right? Or you look to God, the father which is really the, really the, the, you know, the real destination, the real, the real end point. And yes, it is a very much adolescent. Um, it is a very much adolescent um, phase. And, and what you said is, you know, for men to, ex what they're looking for is power. Now, if you don't have your moral authority coming from, from uh, your properly aligned theology, right? God himself as commanded, you have to find another source of power. This is why men get so obsessed with physique so they can show their muscles. Muscles are a display of power. Why they get so obsessed with getting the high score in the money game. I've got billions of dollars. That's power. Why men get so obsessed with firearms. That's power. They're looking for all these outward displays of power they ch and they chase them to death. And you can, f you can easily fall off you know, by focusing too much on your, on your physique, there's nothing wrong with lifting weights. In fact, just before I, I came from working out to before here, but where the physique becomes an object to possess that you build your identity around, it's different. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with owning firearms. I own two firearms, but I'm not a gun guy who links my identity and my sense of self-worth to my firearms. And the same with money, like, like they're like billionaires. They chase, they're just chasing the zeros. There's a point at which the amount of money you have doesn't matter anymore. And you just want access to more rooms of powerful men, more influence. That's all that really is about. Right. And so, because men have no, they have nothing transcendent to root their power in. So they have to root themselves in material power. And that chase is fruitless. And the longer you chase it, the more people will, it's like, okay, I'll give you the appearance of power, 
but you have to give me something in exchange. And this is where you get right. people selling their souls and all this stuff. And it's all the what same stuff. Buttholes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> paging, paging Hollywood. Yeah. Bend over. Um, yeah. For, for, for real, for like real. the whole rap for industry, real. like Birdman. If you look up, if you don't know who Birdman is, look up what Birdman is. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, they, they sold, they sell their soul but it, it becomes this gradual process before they get to that actual ritual where they're selling their right. body, they're abusing themselves and, you know, demeaning themselves essentially. Yeah. For um, the appearance of power. And when actually they're completely powerless. Right. The inverted matrix is ultimately dog eat dog. And that's yes. the thing about it. Um, and it's, and it's very interesting. I mean, you see this stuff in depictions of demons, right? That the demons are always kind of, snapping at each other like attacking yeah. each other right mm -hmm. um they might they're like hyenas you know they kind of work together if they're going after a prey but then they go and attack each other afterwards it's yeah it's uh it's, it's very interesting when you kind of get into the into esoterics um <laughs> but what game are you playing yeah 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 whose game are you playing is probably the better question whose game are you playing exactly exactly and and it's a good point you really made there about having it's not that any of these things are by themselves wrong but it's what what do you assign to them in your life mm -hmm. you know what like honoring your body is important you know intimacy in sexual energy i mean we we didn't we have these for a reason mm -hmm. right all these are not bad things inherently but it's how they're used mm -hmm. and if you and, and while I do think that there's a lot to be said for like finding God through the gutter, you know, especially mm -hmm. given this current era, I think in some ways it's almost an inevitability for people to have to go through that sort of like, oh crap, I'm, you know, what, what am I doing? How do this, like you understand only light from the contrast of dark, mm -hmm. but ultimately the, that process is about helping you to see, okay, this is, this behavior builds me up. This behavior is what's going to set me on the right path and help me to grow and help me to, to integrate. Mm -hmm. So with that, I have, I have a question for you about, Please. um, about women. So I, I put out, I've heard of these things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, uh, they're interesting little creatures. They are mischievous. <laughs> I, I put out, I put out some tweet that, you know, jumbled, you know, rustled, rustled the beehive the other day. Good. It was about women's epiphany phase. Oh yeah. Lots of that happening. Yeah. And so this is something, and, and I actually like, I'm, I'm very open to some, some arguments on this topic because I, I completely get, I completely get why, why this pisses off guys to talk about. Cause what I basically said, I don't know if you saw it, but what I basically said for mm -hmm. the audience is that like, epiphany phase is like bullshit it's not that women decide like oh i'm not gonna get like top tier cock anymore like that they leave the dating market they try to settle down because you know their looks are declining and their value in the market's declining they do uh -huh. it because they get tired of it and they want something more real and more meaningful okay yeah um, that's my conjecture now obviously there's exceptions i'm, I'm sh there are no question some girls who are just banged up and literally literally banged up and you know the only reason that they would try to get out is because you know they're just looking for something to keep up appearances with their friends of course those girls exist but mm. that is not anywhere near the majority of girls sure um so here's the question though first off do you do you fundamentally agree with that that women move out of you know, casual dating into something more real because they get tired of casual dating and how vapid it is. Mm. Um, and they do that because it, yeah, not, not because they like lost power in some sense. Mm. And secondarily, how do you, especially as a Christian, how do you bring, can you, to what extent can you bring forgiveness in in compassion in for girls who have, you know, let's say been on, on the carousel yeah, a bit, you know, and, and I think that the real, the real question here is for those cases where 
a girl maybe did hook up with a good number of guys. I'm not saying like a hundred, but you know, let's say 20 guys, 30 guys or something like that. And she's now 30 and she's genuinely left that world. Doesn't want to be a part of anymore, but she has this baggage. How, how should you as a man, what do you think approach these situations? I am so glad you asked this question. I'm so glad you asked this question. So how should men respond to this? And I can, I can testify this from, from a bit of my story. So I, I lived a promiscuous life for a while, right? Now, what happens when you truly repent and get, and get baptized, you get sanctified and regenerated. And, and the teaching is, you know, God takes from you your heart of stone and gives to you a heart of flesh and begins to heal you spiritually from within. You don't even have to there's no magic there's there's no processes that you have to engage in you have to participate with it you have to to make it, it it makes it more thorough to actually act it out but you begin literally being regenerated and that's what happened with me that's what's mm. still happening with me it's one of the most remarkable things about being christian is feeling the total transformation of my being from from the inside out now for those for those girls and i, I i'm glad that you asked because i have to explain this to so many guys there are a lot of guys that are going the whole trad direction and they they're like you know they're, they're they're hoping that the the magical virgin will come out of the sun the the field with her sundress on and it's like we live in america guys there aren't many of those girls there are a lot of girls even who come from good christian families who quote deconstructed and they had their crazy 20s so the odds of actually like finding finding a virgin if that's something that's important to you it's not high possible who knows god provides but yeah. not high but uh, and I, I and I learned this from Rush V of all people, who's been on his own journey. He says, you know, he he was the one who introduced me to the idea of of women's repentance that the girls can become Christian and not be repentant for their behavior, mm. but to truly repent is to hate your sin, to truly profess faith, get baptized, and go along the process is to hate it within yourself. And so for, for myself, when I look back on my promiscuous lifestyle, I hate it. I hate that I did that. I, I hate that God had to bail me out more times than I probably know. And I can think of a few occasions where I know for sure, but over my whole history, I got, I got bailed out and I was literally saved from myself with no, you know, thank God, no long-term consequences that I, that I, like, I got to leave that behind and be like, what was I doing? Mm -hmm. Completely lost. And for women, I think the concern that men have is this idea of the alpha widow that when, when she's with me, she's going to be thinking about Chad from 10 years ago. Right. I think that's probably what's at the root of a lot of men's concerns. Right. Or, you know, Bob from three months ago, whatever that when she's with me, she's not with me. She's still with him. Right now, real repentance from a woman would look like is any impulse that she would have of ever thinking of those guys again. She detests it. It's not like it's not like she's in some fantasy land when she's with you. She, full revulsion at having done at having lived that way of lived in total sin, despising that part of herself and those decisions, and praying to God to remove any any vestige of that from her. So she's gone and she's reborn. And that is the Christian teaching that we are reborn in Christ, forgiven, washed clean of all of our sins. That's the teaching. And so you said maybe not a lot, 20, 30, even a hundred, mm -hmm. even a hundred, like there'll be a longer regeneration process, a longer repentance process, but true repentance, true rebirth means that you are reborn and you are forgiven. And, and so the, the, the security that a man can find in a woman like that is to know that she's truly repentant and she hates that and she's praying it out of her and it will be removed during her sanctification and regeneration process and that she won't be thinking of Chad. She will hate the person that she was when she was with Chad. She mm -hmm. will hate the person that she was when she was with Bob and she will be so overwhelmingly grateful to have found a man to love her, to care for her, to accept her, that she will regard her husband as her rescuer, a thing that these men that were using her and abusing her and dumping her could never have been. She has been redeemed 
and she has found love and family in a way that those men could never have touched even if they wanted to. And that is a level of deep spiritual connection and love and bond that strips away all of the base physical stuff. It's gone. It's gone. And that's how it feels to be me, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm hoping I'm hoping to be a nice Christian girl to marry, and I'm not going to you know hide my past because I had my time. But when I think back to the women that I've been with, can't remember any of them. Mm-hmm. I can't remember any of them. And when I first started realizing that, it was before I even became Christian. I was thinking back to my escapades, and I was like, of all the women that I've been with, there was only one that I thought of, and that was the one that I was the most in love with. Yeah. Everyone else faded away. I don't even, I mean, like, yeah, I f- don't forget their names kind of thing. Like they're human beings, but like, yeah, no, I don't care about any of that. What was I doing? And now it's like, I, I hate that I lived that entire way. I am, there's a reborn, a rebirthing process. And if it's good enough for God, it needs to be good enough for you as a man. That's the, that's the teaching. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I think it's your own vacation to get there. Right. Right. And I, and I think, you know, that's definitely one of the the reasons that guys, you know, they have this fear that she's not going to be really anchored in the relationship because her pair bonding has been all messed up. That's a good way of putting it. Um, which, you know, I, I'm certainly not discounting, but I, in the secular world, that's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I agree with that. The other two things, though, I think that these guys struggle with is disgust response and, Mm -hmm. you know, and and I think that's an interesting one because, like, are you able to, like, have compassion for a girl, but then also still be disgusted? And does the disgust then damage your ability to to be with her later on? I think a lot of guys have to work through that. But the other Mm -hmm. but the other thing is that um, I think if guys are really honest with themselves, they, if a woman has that kind of experience, it like, they almost feel like they missed out themselves or that they, oh, they couldn't get that themselves. Right. They couldn't have that kind of sexual life. Cause one of the things that's interesting is that you notice that the people who care about it the most are are that like the the secular betas <laughs> they're mm. the ones who get who get the most picked like the secular alphas are kind of like yeah maybe she's like had a had a pass but they're not like super you know they, maybe there's there's a line of what's too much or or but they're not really intimidated by it sure but and then you have you know christian guys who are more anchored in okay did she really go through that repentance you know they can feel that she's not that same person Mm-hmm. That's but a good way of putting it. But I feel like it's like this: these guys who are stuck in the secular world but can't, you know, can't get over it. I think there's a there's a there's a there's a one of the things that's happening very subtly is that there's also growing a kind of idolatry of marriage and kids, mm-hmm. right? Like it's a very natural thing, and it's a very res- it's a response to a lot of the craziness of the world. But I think a lot of guys get into get they get caught up in the they make it into an idol in mm-hmm. some ways. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're saying that I think fixating on that is missing the point of the total human. Like if you're going to, if you're going to boil a woman's worth down to her hymen, I mean, like, I don't know that that's, I don't know. That's a great way to look at it. Like a woman's ability to be a, a good wife and a good mother and, a, and to help you make a home together and to truly love you and appreciate you and support you. All those are so much more important to me than a hymen. Yeah. Like I get it. I get it. I understand, but like the partnership of a man and woman truly in love, truly to create a home and foster the next generation. Like, look, we're all, all of us, everyone listening to this, we are living in the ashes of war. Mm-hmm. It's so bad. The, the worst thing about 2023 is the illusion of normalcy. Nothing is normal. No. We are really living in the it's aftermath. Bad. It's bad. And so if, if you get spit out of that into a happy home with a woman who's also a refugee like you, praise God. Thank God. Well, you know, I, I think that's an interesting way that you, that you just put it. It's a refugee. Yeah. Cause it I'm is a refugee. It is, a thousand percent. It is kind of like a refugee situation. I mean, you, you almost, you see 
everything around you getting destroyed and it's and it's like who's kind of walking out of the rubble it's been destroyed everybody has these stories and trauma and there's and you know i think a lot of them aren't you know a lot of people aren't surviving i mean i don't necessarily want to go too literal with that but what i mean is that certainly i (laughs) i think a large portion of this population doesn't have a future and it's hard to argue otherwise but but among the ones that do there are going to you're going to have to tolerate some degree of the fact that these people came out of the same shithole that you came out of yeah um you know i i do think that guys have to kind of decide to what extent that they they want to be able to accept you know and it's up to them you know yeah. that, that's everybody's individual choice like i i understand why you know some girl maybe she's repented but she's been like gang banged and stuff like that you know i i get it yeah, like you know, maybe you can't um <laughs> you, know, you can't go there like i, I get I, it i don't think i don't think though that any man other man tell has can tell another guy where his line is mm-hmm. but I think it is something that at a minimum men need to have more compassion and understanding of what women have had to go through as well. And, you know, take some of their own ego out of it. I mean, they might not be ready to be in a relationship because they have too much ego in it. Yeah. And none of this is like an exhortation that you have to accept any specific girl. But it's just when I hear some of these guys talking, it's like, dude, what planet do you live on? What planet do you live on? You know, you're pissed about all this stuff. But first off, you're a hypocrite because you want, you know, you're out there trying to smash girls. Mm, Exactly. Second, second, you know, what is your what's your constructive solution to the problem? (laughs) You know, like it. I, it's well we go back to the adolescent stuff you know yeah. it's it, it's it's hard to it's hard but it's part of maturity is yeah. being able to to get over a lot of that stuff yeah we are all walking casualties of war on men on women on masculinity femininity marriage family we're all casualties of war mm-hmm. we're all walking off those of us who are lucky enough we're all walking off the battlefield with scars and stories and regrets and pain and praise god those of us who are still walking because many of we know many people who aren't and I'm, I'm speaking spiritually metaphorically here who are stuck on the battlefield chasing illusions and if you get to walk off i've had to reflect on this myself like I'm not in a relationship right now. Um, and it's, you know, I just have to trust God that the right woman will be along for me at the right time when I'm ready for it. And that's mm-hmm. a challenge. That's a challenge. But I've been reflecting on like, what would the right woman for me kind of look like? Like ultimately it's not up for me. Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm a participant in the process, but it's like, would really the right woman be for me, a church girl raised in a church family, right? Who's, who's has been minimal exposure to the world. Or would the right girl for me be a fellow refugee from the new age like me so that we can actually talk about that? And so like we have these experiences that like, how crazy was that? And to take it apart, I don't know. Ultimately, God will decide. But there's a real question to be asked. Like there's a level of wanting to be understood in relationship and communicating like you can't understand my experiences. It's like, well, what if I want to share them? I could never explain some of the new age stuff that I've done to someone who has no frame of reference for them. They're important parts of my story. Right. So I've, I've been sitting with that question. You know, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm really gl- glad that you brought that up because, and I think this is a discussion, like you lose a lot of guys with it because maybe they're not ready to, to talk on this level with sure. it. You know, they're going to project all sorts of crap onto you, but in, in some ways you want somebody who's gone through a lot of this stuff because they have the same sort of level of consciousness and perception. Like they're as a result, they've, they've explored the shadow 
whether they wanted to or not, they went through this. And I've, I've pointed this out, but less clearly before with, you know, the, the obsession with, with virgins and trying to get this young girl. It's like, well, they want to get a girl who's unspoiled and I get it, mm -hmm. but the nature of the current war is such that those girls, I mean, let's just say it's, it's difficult to fully, um, shield them from the influences and you might think you're getting a girl who's unspoiled but really you got a girl who's just about to go down the gutter herself and i i've heard stories from pastors and churches yeah. you know young married couples both virgins and the girl goes off and she becomes a total slut happens a lot it happens a lot poor discipleship from our parents yeah yeah and and so i mean not that I'm saying that that's any kind of guarantee that that's going to happen, but there's something to the fact that like you come out of, out of a war and you've got some sort of, you know, 18 year old girl from theoretical utopia. She has no idea what you've gone through. That's right. No idea what you've gone through. And there's going to be, and I, I've had clients who've dated a girl, she's a great girl, but there's almost this kind of naiveness and there's a way that they can't really click on a certain level because she hasn't gone to where he's gone. And so it's like some of these guys, like they've gone to a certain point, like it's just a Madonna fantasy that they're going to get this like perfect girl that she's mm. going to save them from their own impurity mm. at, at that point. I mean, you, they'll have had to go probably there. If they were, you know, reformed homemaker, right. They're going to, probably have some degree of a girl who's had her own sort of slut phase that's right. just a practical thing because they'll be able to both say yeah we went through that and we came out and i, I like just again to for the audience i love that you talked about it from the sense of refugees because think about like germany after world war ii that's... i mean how many of how many couples do you think were formed of you know teenage soldiers and girls who've been raped by soviets yeah. A lot of people don't know about that, by the way, the Soviet thing. Thank you for yeah. mentioning it. I'm like, like over a million. I mean, I think it was like a million rapes or something. Horrifying. Like horrifying. horrifying. And and so, I mean, do you think that those guys were really butthurt about it? <laughs> no. Like I, I, I'm I'm sure that they were just like, Yeah, that was a really shitty time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You got raped, my friend got blown up in front of me. Yeah. And I still got shrapnel in me. And exactly. we're gonna move on. That's because right. we don't let's move on to better things. Let's build something better rather than you know, remember that. Yeah, I feel that. I really feel that. It's yeah. true. And and that's that's the place that I'm kind of in. It's like, hey, like we survived. You know, yeah. like ultimately it's not up to me. Like someone will someone will come along who'll be the right person for me, and that's up to God. But I think to, I think to 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 have these artificial constraints when we have survived a war, we're still surviving a war. We're going through war. That to understand that who the right woman might be for you as a partner, to be open to that, mm -hmm. to be to be open to that, and, and 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 to be aware when she comes along, and to be prepared to be forgiving, because you as a man, you have your own history, you do. Mm -hmm. And um, you've repented and been forgiven for that in so many ways. May not, maybe not sexually, but in many other ways. If you've experienced that, then you have to give the same grace to a woman who has to go through it herself. And then together, you can be refugees together. And you, as a man, have to let that go. You are called by God to let that go. And any judgments that she may have for you and for your story, she's called by God to let that go too. And this is how we create a new civilization out of the ashes of an old one. You know, not trying to, you know, time travel some girl from the 1850s forward to today. Maybe, but probably well, not. Well, you know, it's funny about even that analogy is that that's what some guys are trying to do, you know, and they talk about you got to get yourself a girl from Eastern Europe or you got to get yourself a right. girl from Southeast yeah. Asia or Latin Asia. America. It's not yeah. Better. And, you know, as someone with an Eastern European wife, I think I <laughs> can, true. I can, I can comment on this topic. And it's just nonsense. I mean, you want to keep like, look, they're good women. And I, and I do think that there's, that there's truth to the fact that there's less brainwashing. So there's less to unravel. 
Fair enough. But I've heard this kind of story all the time. I mean, you want to take a girl from a village in Belarus and bring her to Los Angeles. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, good luck, good, with that. good luck with that. Yeah. You know, you move to her village if you want to keep her <laughs> if you want to keep her in the 1850s, right? Yeah. Like this is this is the thing. Fair enough if you want to go back to the remnants of these trad societies and try to integrate yourself with that. If you yourself want to go back in time, but you can't bring her to where we are and not expect her to go through the same process of exposure. I, I look at this stuff, Will, like it is in a knock. It's almost like an inoculation of mm -hmm. sorts. Like you, you almost, you're getting exposed to the virus and a lot of people die and other people develop an immunity. Mm. And we're judging people. It's like, I don't want to be with anybody who's got the virus. It's like, well, if you get exposed, you're going to get it. Mm, the and, modernity virus. Yeah. And the question is, were you able to survive it? And then you can move on from this, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, the number of girls who are like living in a cave who haven't been exposed to it. And by the way, I'm not even so sure that there's like, from what I hear of even in these like third world countries, it's getting touched everywhere. I mean, they have maybe more, some more defenses, but no place is untouched mm -hmm. at this point. And you know what? If you were to find a place like that, you wouldn't relate to anything in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those women would be like, who the fuck are you? Beta? Who the fuck are you? Who's, who's yeah. you? You, can't, you can't, you know, you can't kill a crocodile with your hands. You know, you can't go out there. Like they start great point. with a nice feminine girl but they start to realize that they're really not that masculine anymore themselves compared to the men that she's familiar with yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i've been to um 33 countries around the world and one of the things um that i can tell you is that you know a lot of these girls from these remote areas i haven't been to eastern europe but you know i can tell you that a lot of these girls they're more sophisticated than they seem yeah they may they may present very trad, very sweet, very delicate, but like, especially like Eastern, my fa part of my family's Eastern European, the wheels are turning, you know, yeah. it's not like, tell me what to do. You know, like you can see there's a person back there and you think that you're just going to show up. And because she's from, from some Eastern European or Southeast Asian country, that she's not a person with her own wants and dreams and aspirations, that she's just there to follow you blindly into the American field of paradise. Like that doesn't work like that. And you make a really good point about like, even if you were to find that the corrupting influence of modernity is intense, here's a smartphone, have fun with that. You know, and, and so and so I think the dream, the dream of some of finding some unspoiled person who can remain unspoiled for life and, and not be susceptible to that first infection of the fever, you know, because that would be the thing. I, I want someone who doesn't have the virus. Well, the first time they get it, the modernity virus, it's going to hit real hard. Mm -hmm. Are you prepared for that? How are you going to how are you going to protect from that? Does your wife have to become your child? Like. And I think men don't actually think it through because I don't think it's rational. I understand it. I get it. I get it. But I don't think it's ultimately rational. I think it's it's um, the the um, the less generous interpretation is that it's born out of insecurity. Mm -hmm. The generous and the generous interpretation is um, out of a desire to build something more in line with traditional values and not understanding how to build something in line with traditional values with um, fragments of something. Mm -hmm. Like, can we, can we use these broken fragments to build something whole? Well, what if I just start with something whole? That's the generous interpretation. There's another point I want to make that's kind of like oblique to this, which is mm -hmm. because it underpins it all, like you were saying earlier, the alpha widow thing. Right, it's and real. It's, it's real, but I don't think most guys know what actually alpha widows girls <laughs> you know i'm i mean the so much of this like she's always thinking about about chad she's always thinking about you know this guy that she had been with in the past so much of it has to do with the fact that a woman is a woman is alpha widowed by the guy who penetrates her the most now you can look at that on a physical sense. Sure, there's more to it than that. But there's more to it than that. It's an emotional thing too, that he's able to penetrate her emotionally 
and get to a layer of her emotionally that no other guy has gotten to. Mm, I haven't heard that before. That's great. So, you know, when, when like this idea that a girl would have a one night stand and then she's always thinking about that is just beyond absurd. It's beyond mm -hmm. absurd. And it's, it's when guys are playing in the shallow area and they're so focused on the shallow area. Well, yeah, you're going to lose to that because first off, you're coming across super insecure. But second off, what are you offering to a woman that's actually making an impact to her? What, what are you doing that's, that's like pushing her out of her current prior existence mm -hmm. that she can't go back to again? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to, to take away the fact that, that sex can have a very powerful effect in that realm. But connected to that is the emotional penetration. And most guys just don't know how to do it. And part of emotional penetration is acceptance. Mm -hmm. So if a man is automatically judging and rejecting a girl, he's not going to mm -hmm. penetrate her emotionally. And mm -hmm. so guys get themselves into this sort of trap and um, where, you know, they really are impotent when it comes to mm. a woman's emotions. So I love the way you talk. I love the way you talk about this stuff. <laughs> Seriously. It's so, it's, it's so spot on your language around it. Just really narrow nails these concepts. Um, you know, and, and regarding the penetration issue, there's, I think there's another dimension to it because the kind of woman that would be, you know, man would worry about with the whole alpha widow thing. Okay, so we're talking about something called like dating and dating has two components, an emotional and some amount of emotional component and some amount of sexual component. And those two are interlinked. And so but that's a very different level. That's a very different way of living. It's based on a set of values versus marriage, family, kids, values, legacy, right? right. Dating, dating, and we'll, we'll label that all under legacy. Right. Dating and legacy are two different ways of looking at life. You're either going to date casually or you're going to be the kind of person who wants to build a legacy. Mm -hmm. And a man and, and and you can penetrate a woman physically or emotionally, right? And like, great, cool. But the the depth of penetration in terms of legacy, of living on your 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 contribution to humanity, to your family, to children lives on through the generations. If you can offer that to a woman. And if a woman can offer that to a man, that's deep soul level fulfillment. That's what we're designed to do. And by, by comparison, dating is impossibly shallow mm -hmm. versus legacy building. Leg dating takes place over three months. <laughs> legacy building takes place over five decades or more, centuries. You know, And so that's what I think, that's what I know that's what we're made to do. That's in Genesis you know, down through the generations, Abraham, like that's part of what we're doing, be fruitful and multiply down through legacy. And so when a man meets a woman who can offer that to him, and when, uh, when a woman meets a man who can offer that to her, that's a completely different level of, of penetration to the point where the word stops really losing meaning. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, and so to think about that, it's like, yeah, sure. Like I dated a lot when I was, I was, uh, you know, in my twenties, she says, but I never met any man who could offer me anything close to what you offer me. Right. And, and he can say that to her, like I can build a legacy with you. Yes. Boom. Past gone. Yeah. That's the priority. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, it, women are really starved for something deeper. They're starved yeah. for more. Now I, I do think that a lot of them self-sabotage that. And if they see a guy who's willing to offer them more that, you know, one of the things that's interesting about when a woman starts to become promiscuous and it's not only from promiscuity, obviously, but when a woman starts to become promiscuous, it's, it starts to affect her self-worth. Yeah. You know, and, and she can tell herself whatever she wants on the surface, but the best case scenario you're going to get from it is, as a result of, you know, hooking up for a bit, I realized that I was degrading myself. And so I became more self-aware and I was able to, you know, that's, that's like the most generous way that you can view mm -hmm. when a woman does that stuff, because the process of it is like, I'm not worth anything besides for this. 
like on an unconscious genetic level, women understand it makes them into basically a whore who is yeah. just being used the body. And you can say like, well, I'm the one who's doing it. You know, I chose to do it like to try to take some agency back, but it's just cope. It's just mm -hmm. cope. And so the issue is that when a woman's done that enough, she begins to associate herself as a whore, right? And so one way or another, one way or another. And so even though she would never say that to herself consciously, when a man is treating her well, and when a man wants more mm. from her, she might make him, you know, a lot of guys will construe it like this guy was a beta. And, you know, maybe he was a little bit, who knows, who knows in the situation, maybe there were some certain things he didn't, he didn't grasp. Obviously there was a lack of awareness because he couldn't call it out. Mm -hmm. If he didn't know what was going on, but the woman will often step away from it, sabotage it, leave him for some, you know, retard because that's what she feels like she deserves. Mm, yeah. It's heavy. So I think that's why, you know, what you're, what you're saying, what, why a lot of guys will resort to the sort of heuristic about what a woman's count is because they can't actually perceive internal changes in a woman. So it's like, they, you know, it's kind of like, I, I, I can't, I can't, uh, I don't, I don't know what a good, it's like, they're missing a sense. Let's put it that way. They're missing absolutely a perception. And so they can't say, okay, yeah, this girl had a past, but she's, she's like hates her past and she's moved on from, and she believes now that she's worthy of love again, mm -hmm. which is very different from a girl who's like very unconscious and just like, okay, you know, maybe some guy can like rescue me from all yes. this, stuff, which is yeah. a recipe for disaster because she hasn't left it and she could very well go back to it. And, and so, yeah, I, she I belongs think, to the streets. He's going to the streets. I mean, and this is this is the <laughs> online conversation. It's why it's so difficult. Yes. Like we're having a sophisticated conversation here, talking about all these distinctions. Yes, we are. For guys, you know, you you try to talk about this stuff, and first off, their triggers are just going off. Every single thing you're saying is like a trigger, yeah. emotional trigger. But it, it's, you know, because I can I can throw also on the opposite. I have met virgins who are totally fucked up. Absolutely sure. totally fucked up. And, a and lot of that. this is a super controversial take, but I'm just telling people what I have observed is that in this society, which is so disgusting and has pushed such a huge sexual, you know, degenerate kind of agenda, not all, but many of the girls who are virgins are virgins because they're almost emotionally messed up in some way that they didn't go along with it, at least for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, and I know that that pisses off people to hear, but I'm just, I've seen this girls who are yeah. 24, 28, you know, even in their thirties, they never had sex before and they have super high amounts of anxiety. They're, they're not being sexual, not because they're good girls. They're not being sexual because they're anxious and they're scared of connecting with anybody. Mm -hmm. so i mean but for a lot of guys they you know it takes away one variable they think that maybe this is going to be you know the better path because they can't perceive the nuance of where that girl's psyche actually is they're just like okay well you know her parents are together you know she hasn't had sex like okay she's like has no friends and she's like freaked out to like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, like, well, are you, they, they can't look at, they can't weigh all these var variables together. But. Right. Or, or maybe like, maybe she had a, she didn't actually have sex. Maybe she made out with some dude or whatever and like feel super duper guilty about it. And yeah. that was completely shut off her own. Like she hasn't actually done the thing, but like she hates herself and is like really afraid. Am yeah. I going to hell? You know what I mean? Like it's, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty bad. You know, it's pretty bad. This is what happens when you have, a, 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 I guess, a theology, even if you're Christian, without sin and repentance, which is like, yeah, you screwed up. It's okay. God forgives you if you if you sincerely turn from from sin and you and you commit to never do it again. You're forgiven. Damn. Yes, it can be. It's like that. Yeah, you can't ever. Don't do it again, or you know, don't consciously do it again. We could we could break that all down. But like, it really is healing to the psyche. And another thing I wanted to say about about a lot of these girls. Um, 
you know, who, who perceive themselves as whores, this is, this is the downside, again, another downside of the theology of feminism. If you believe that women have been oppressed through all of history, what does that mean for you as a woman? How does that mean you have to behave? How it, ha- it means you have to behave is you have to act in contrary to the oppression that you see. So what does that mean? You've been kept out of the workplace, meaning you have to work. You've been a slave to your womb, essentially, you know, bearing the next generation. So have lots of casual sex and discard your womb and discard the contents of it if necessary. Mm -hmm. You own your sex girl doesn't belong to any man. How about you get really obese because beauty standards are also oppression. How about you shave your head? How about Mm -hmm. you change your gender? All of these are feminist rebellion against, um, you know, they call it patriarchy, but really it's God's created order, Mm -hmm. you know, patriarchy or white supremacy is what they call it. But I mean, that's what the theology of feminism drives women to do. It's ultimately so destructive to women. It destroys them. In fact, it doesn't destroy them. It leads them to destroy themselves, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's the real tragic thing to see is that there are so many girls who grew up, even in Christian families, as part of the virus, as part of the virus of modernity, they grew up thinking that women have been oppressed through all of history. So if you don't have a career, you are betraying womankind. You must have a career. Your God commands you to have a career to make up for all the oppression of women. Your God commands you to have sex and have fun and 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 own your sexuality, you know, and just be reckless with it because those patriarchal male, males are trying to oppress you and keep you locked into the home with kids. Like that's what the feminists said. That's the own. That's their own thing, and it, it ruins women. Yeah, and it's and it's such nonsense too. I mean, <laughs> yeah like that women have been oppressed throughout history. I mean, what what about, what about men? I mean, you know, if you want to get into the victim game, we're have men, you know, especially during this industrial revolution, industrial warfare period. Yeah. You know, they were the oppressors, right? Well, maybe they oppressed themselves. Like they went against themselves, but Mm -hmm. most men, it was brutal. The sacrifice that they had to give Mm -hmm. brutal. And yeah. women should show some fucking respect. Yeah. Show some fucking respect for the sacrifices the men your male fo- forefathers gave to you. You're so fucking entitled. Show some respect. Absolutely, absolutely. I tell I tell women that like, look, we're going to transport you back in time, and you might end up in the body of a man or the body of a woman, like fifty fifty, right? Like to- like the move like the show Quantum Leap. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now consider the average life of a man all throughout history. Let's go prior to the industrial revolution, the ways that men die screaming in warfare, mining accidents, mauled to death by wild animals. Right. Think of all the ways that men die and the, and the lives that men have to leave lead versus the way that women have led throughout history, being cared for and shepherded by men. Now you're 50, 50 shot. Would you rather be a man or woman throughout history? Guaranteed, if any woman thinks it through, she'd rather be a woman. Yeah. So oppressed, like, <laughs> you guys, two roles. I did a tweet about this. There's two roles, childbirth or trench warfare. Pick one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's history. Yeah. And and look, I mean, I will, I will say to be fair to women, childbirth used to be a, a pretty, you know, scary thing, right? Yeah. In the, it's still I mean, scary in its own way. It's scary, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's obviously intense. And I think it's an initiation for women. There's no question mm-hmm. about that. Um, but, you know, the chances of you dying in childbirth today, it's not its not really a risk, at least not like it used to be. Not I mean, like I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, and I'm pissing off people, but like, let's be fucking honest about this for a second. You used to die at a not insignificant rate. And now you don't. So the risk has gone down quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if you're in good health, if you're like a healthy woman, like, you know, if you're morbidly obese, okay, you might have some issues, but anyway, um, we only got a few more minutes left I, there. I did want to, want to get to two, two topics, which I think maybe are going to be related for you. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you were talking about, you, you had talked about this wave and how we're about the, the crest are about to hit this, this new wave of, um, you know, men being fathers and that that's, this is kind of like what you would say the death of the manosphere. Would you, would you, would you call it that? Is it death of the red pill or is it, is it death of the manosphere or is that semantics? Um, and also how does like integrated being an integrated man, how does it tie into all of this? Mm, okay. 
so the, the nothing is nothing is going to kill the manosphere the manosphere is going to kill itself it already okay. is it already well, is what do you what do you see happening well so the dialogue shifted sometime in the past couple of years from fitness personal finance and feminism anti-feminism to fatherhood faith and family right, right. faith is a big part of that because you know the, what the manosphere was was really good at is saying this is these are the things that men do men work out you know sometimes men drink beer men eat steak you know men, men make money right okay what the manosphere wasn't good at is saying what are men for why do men exist you can't get that out of evolutionary psychology you can't get that out of evolution it only it only comes from religion that's right. why that's where meaning comes from and so men so you talk about bronze age pervert right and there are other authors in the, in 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 that era that talk about what men do completely independently of their relationship to women as if mm -hmm. men are these creatures that just exist solely on earth and like what we do isn't in relation to women isn't in relation to becoming fathers and, and creating a legacy and 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 uh, and, and uh, perpetuating the next generations so the question of why can really only be answered with religion and when you start asking why do men exist and what are men for you land on fatherhood family legacy things like that mm -hmm. those things are incompatible with promiscuity mm -hmm. you can't say hey dude go out and get laid with 100 girls and then don't worry you'll get married it'll be fine mm -hmm. like that's a that's a recipe for a disastrous marriage without repentance and particularly today like mm -hmm. maybe you could have gotten away with that message five years ago but today in this in this hyper toxified environment it's like no you gotta you gotta get your life right now or you because if you're wasting time money and energy getting late on the weekends shouldn't you be storing up for the winter because winter is coming mm -hmm. right so so that so these things are incompatible um incompatible with promiscuity it's incompatible with the past of the manosphere which is born out of the pickup era so a lot of the guys from the manosphere came from the pickup era in order to transition into being good fathers they have to repent from their entire past they have to dis disavow all of it like mm -hmm. rush v did Mm -hmm. Rush, Rush v disavowed all of it, burned his books and everything. Respect to that guy. Mm -hmm. Respect to that guy for doing it. A lot of people think it's a show, but like he's doing the things that I would do if I were in his position and that a good man would do. So this was the transition point that was hit. The Manosphere is not succeeding in that transition point. Mm -hmm. It is not successfully, the leading voices are not successfully transitioning into fatherhood, faith, and family. Quite the opposite. They're resisting it. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you have guys like Jack Murphy popping out. You have Roman McClay popping out, Jesse Lee Peterson popping, right? Like all the, and the massive amounts of drama, more names than I can count. I don't want to drag anyone in, but I could mention a lot of names with drama. And so there's all these internal dynamics that are going to hold the manosphere, which I thought held a lot of promise for men. It's going to hold it back from being able to truly contribute to the dialogue because the dialogue is being driven by Christianity now. The mm -hmm. only thing that can push back on modernity, the only thing that can push back on um, on the woke mind virus, because the woke mind virus is modern after model after Christianity, is Christianity. And if yeah. you want to play in that field, you have to repent of your entire past, confess your sin, and, and do the whole thing. And then you're welcomed in with open arms. But if you're saying things like Christianity is garbage, I don't believe in God, blah, 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 guess what? You don't get to be part of that dialogue. And that's the direction that many in the manosphere have chosen to go. So it will naturally reach the end of its contribution to the dialogue. It made its contribution. It was a very valuable contribution, not denying that at all. But the dialogue has moved past that point in the same way that it moved past the myth of poetics and moved past um, the pickup era. It's going to move past the manosphere and that's happening. And it, it, we're starting to see it happen. I'm starting to see it with, happen within churches several conferences are like pastors priests are asking like well what about masculinity within christianity that dialogue is happening and you know in this backwards way a certain bugatti driving guy is also driving the conversation i don't want to say his name because i don't his whole thing is about being this really big deal so i don't say his name he doesn't get he doesn't get me to you know to play his game but like he's led the conversation into the mainstream he's like well what does it mean to be a ban is that it and I said, I have, I have said for the past six months or a year that he was the apex predator of the manosphere. Mm. He was, you know who I'm talking about, right? It's clear who I'm talking. Okay, cool. Is that he did all the things that all the manosphere guys only talked about. He mm. was the guy who really fought the fights. He had the real body. He made the real money. He drove the real cars. Like he had all the women 
right? Like he did it all. He's the guy who did all the things that those guys talked about and made it to the highest levels of culture. And you can take him down without having to file spurious charges at him. But a lot of guys are looking and saying, is that actually what it means to be a man? I don't well, think that's it. <laughs> it's interesting from a postmodern, you know, lens to think sure. if he deconstructed it in a certain mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. <laughs> by, by well said. By being the only person who really achieved it. It's it's interesting. I think it's going to be really interesting to see where it goes with the general pendulum swing. Um mm -hmm. because that is coming and we can all feel it coming. It's it's brewing right now in the background of the of the collective consciousness. And so when that starts to pick up steam, I try to be optimistic. I think a lot of these individuals will, you know, once you realize a certain game isn't, you know, that that game isn't in season anymore, you'll start to see more momentum mm -hmm. jump off of it. But uh, time will tell. Time will tell. I'm trying to prevent the pendulum swing back the other way. I'm trying to prevent that because we've been on one side. The swing well, is going to come yeah. the other way. The Renaissance is about stopping that in the middle. So in the middle, really, yeah. yeah. We do yeah. got to get back to the middle, but I, I do want to get. Yeah, I don't want to stop it. Period. Yeah, yeah. I know, but I, I agree with you. Going, going through a, a severe reaction is not what we want. It, it just goes. We just go right back here, and I do think a lot of, um, a lot of trads in particular don't, don't get that. No, you know, and anyway, but I got to run, man. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate this. Tell everybody real quick, where can they find you? Uh, you can find links to me on social media, my podcast at linktree slash rent of men. And if you want to learn more about my uh, 12 week Renaissance men's mentorship, that's rent of men.com slash mentorship. Very proud of that program. Their testimonials and information on rent of men.com slash mentorship. All the links will be in the description. Brilliant. Thanks so much, guys. Great we'll to see you, man. See. Thanks, Pat.